Okay. Well, it's time to get started. So good morning and welcome to our webinar titled Employee Retention, Creating an Inclusive and Accessible Workspace with Successful Career Paths, sponsored by Disability in Wisconsin. My name is Juan Banda and I'm your host for today and I'm proud to be here. I'm the Human Resource Director for the Freighter Hospital Campus, which is part of the Freighter Health System. I'm also Freighter's representative on the Board of Directors at Disability in Wisconsin. Let me share a brief overview of Disability in Wisconsin in our session today. Disability in Wisconsin empowers business to achieve disability inclusion and equality. Our Wisconsin affiliate is comprised of local leaders from member businesses who have a passion for helping people with disabilities enter and succeed in the workforce. At Frederick Hospital, we have a commitment to fostering a supportive environment where staff with disabilities, with different abilities, perspectives, and experiences can reach their full potential inside our organization and beyond. Partnering with Project Search, Transcend Inc., and the Threshold Inc. helps to meet our mission to address the socioeconomic, environmental, and behavioral factors, including employment, that are critical to well being. We regularly sponsor interns, job seekers, and have hired talented employees through our effort. I'm thrilled that today we can closely look at employee retention and share successful outcomes. In the first half of today's session, our speakers will cover programs and resources that support their employee experience, such as onboarding, centralized accommodations, a self ID campaign, and diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives with a specific focus on their disability PRG. In the second half of the session, our speakers will hold a panel discussion with several of the disability BRG focused chapter leaders who will share how their chapters work, the purpose of support circles, and the successful outcomes of their chapter's efforts. Before I introduce the speakers, let me review our housekeeping tips. Today's session will be recorded with closed captioning. We want your feedback and questions. You can use the Q&A feature at any time to submit a question or comment to our panelists. While we have time for questions, our panel will address your questions as we go. The recording will be sent to all those who registered in the next few weeks. So let's get started. If we can move the slide uh, with our, our distinguished panel. Perfect, thank you. So I'm pleased to introduce today's team from US Bank, one of our member businesses with local presence in Milwaukee. Kelly Risser is the Accessibility Banking Director at US Bank. In her role, she oversees the Accessibility Banking Program. Astrid Benedetto is Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Strategy Manager at US Bank. She leads the strategy for the Asian Disability and European Employee Segments. And Emily Norberg is a Disability and Access Accessibility Consultant at US Bank. Her work focuses on identifying and impl implementing strategic activities that improve access and inclusion for employees with disabilities. And now I'm going to turn it over to Astrid Benedetto, who will share more about our speakers and begin today's session. Thank you so much. Hi, hello, everyone. Welcome to Disability in Wisconsin session. I'm going to start with my visual description here. Um, and actually, um, if we can, here's just a quick slice on what we will cover today. On the next slide, please. So I will go over our approach, DEI strategy and area of focus, including our access commitment. And Emily Norenberg is going to cover supporting the employee experience and then follow up by Kelly Risser, who's going to talk a little bit about our disability business resource group. And she's also going to introduce in the back half uh, our focus chapter discussion. So let me start with my visual description. I'm an Asian woman with long curly hair. I'm wearing a pinstripe blazer with a black t-shirt. Um, let's, before we get too deep, I wanna just first discuss how US Bank is really approaching diversity, equity, and inclusion. On the next slide here, if we can advance to the next slide, please. Kelly, thank you. Language, um, as we all know, really matters, right? It helps us have a common understanding about what diversity, equity, and inclusion means. Diversity, it's really inherent. It's what sets us apart, what makes us different and unique, 
and inclusion is the magic action. My favorite analogy is for diversity is about inviting someone to come to the party while inclusion, it's really about asking the people there to dance, right? And if you take a step further, belonging, it's really about asking them to come plan the party, come plan the dance. What type of music should we play? That is what belonging means. And on the next slide, I, I want to stress the difference between equality and equity. A few years ago at US Bank, we are very intentional about adding equity to our diversity and inclusion effort. Equality is about treating everyone the same, giving everyone the same access and support and also resources, which is great, right? If we're all exactly the same, however, we're not. And so equity, essentially, the idea is to give people what they need, right? Specific to their, their own need so that they can have their best opportunity to succeed. So in this picture, by providing equitable options for everyone, right? As you can see, the wheel or the bike, essentially, it, it changes for every different person versus equality you're seeing everybody get exactly the same bike. Because our organization's commitment to equity, it really allow us to acknowledge, yes, we recognize that customers who have disabilities are more likely to face different challenges compared to customers who do not have disabilities. And all of our initiatives are for the benefit of everyone. And everyone in this case is employees, our customers, businesses and the communities that we live in. At US Bank, we use data to support most of our decision. On the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit more about our DEI strategy. Um, at US Bank, we are recognized nationally for our commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion. And we're especially proud to be climbing to diversity in top 50 companies for diversity list. This year, a fourth year in a row where US Bank was able to make it to the diversity top 50 list. And we were, we rose to number 17 versus four years ago, we were number 46, right? So this is um, something that we're super proud of. I wanna mention a couple of accolades on the disability that we are also very proud of. This year is our fifth consecutive year on scoring 100 on Disability Equality Index from Disability In. We're aware that scoring 100 doesn't mean that we are already doing things well for the disability community. Our goal is to ensure that we continue to power the potential of our employees and customers with disabilities. We still have a long journey ahead of us and especially in the digital accessibility space. We are also recognized by NOD, National Organization on Disability, as the leading disability employer the fourth year in a row. Emily will share more details later on during her presentation on how the bank does to power potential of our employees with disability. And Kelly will also share more about our employee groups and what she's working on from the lens of her day job in compliance. Our DEI strategy is rooted in our purpose, core values, and strategy. Our purpose is really about powering human potential. This applies equally to all U.S. Bank employees at every level and in every facet of our business without any exception. And this is true for all of our stakeholders. And our stakeholders comprise of customers, community, business, and our employees. At US Bank, we have five core values that help guide our actions. We do the right thing. We power potential. We stay a step ahead. We draw strength from diversity and we put people first. These core values help guide our actions, what we do and what we say. In the next few slides, I wanna just stay, um, share the statistics 
on why diversity, equity, and inclusion really matters. So the first, uh, this slide here is taken from McKinsey and Company. They had issued a research paper called Delivering Through Diversity back in 2018. In that paper, McKinsey showed that the business case on why diversity matters, right? Powering the potential for all our customer is the right thing to do, but it's also crucial for our growth as a company. And companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 33% more likely to have better financial returns above their national industry medians. So I wanna let that sink in a little bit. And on the next slide, gender diversity. So the study, the same research paper also shows that companies in the top quartile for gender diversity are 21% more likely to have better financial returns compared to the national industry medians. That's why diversity and inclusion, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is not only a part of our core value, but also a part of our business strategy. In the next slide, this is a research that is done by Accenture. Accenture research shows that companies that have improved their DEI score over time, or what the research called improvers, they are four times more likely to have total shareholder returns that outperform their peers compared to those of non-improvers. So on average, the improvers total shareholder return outperform the industry peers by 53%, right? That is really significant. On the next slide, um, I wanna talk a little bit about kind of what the, the fact is. In addition to the statistics that I just shared, one of the facts that's really intriguing is the, the notion that US population is becoming more diverse. By the year 2050, there will not be a majority race in the US. And statistically speaking, 97% of growth in the financial industry footprint will actually be coming from diverse customers. And with client acquisition as one of the company's top six priorities at the bank, we can't choose to ignore this diverse population needing to be a part of our growth strategy. So focusing on diversity is really a priority at US Bank. And we need to reflect and really understand the customers that we will be serving, because this is gonna be the mirror of that, the, com the community that we will be serving as well. All right, um, we thought about where we can use strength as a bank to help make a difference, right? And what we found is that there is a racial wealth gap in the US and we can use our influence as a financial institution to help close that wealth gap. So let me just um, shift gear a little bit and talk about racial wealth gap for a moment. In the US, a gap in household wealth by ethnicity creates barrier to socioeconomic mobility for black, Hispanic individuals, families, and also communities. What most interesting about the gap is that this does not just affect black or Hispanic, but it affects all US households. The racial wealth gap constrains um, the US economy as a whole, right? It's, it's resulting about one to one and a half trillion dollars in lost economic output. And that equates about four to six percent on our GDP. The closing the gap result in an overall increase in US GDP, but also could put up to $12,000 back in the pockets of every American household over time. So this is a win for all the stakeholders and also for our business. So I wanna stress the, the fact about creating opportunity doesn't really mean that we are taking 
an opportunity from someone else, right? We're actually expanding that opportunity for everyone. I have a few more slides here to share. Um, next, I will touch on briefly on how diversity, equity, and inclusion shows up across our company. So at US Bank, we really look at in different, we're really differentiated in our approach to DEI because we look at all of areas of the business and we also embed DE&I in everything that we do. So it's not just a one-off workforce initiative. It's really part of our overall business strategy. As a financial institution, we are uniquely positioned to help create a more equitable environment. So for instance, by helping build wealth gap, by helping build wealth and close the persistent wealth gap, we are focusing on four pillars that make up our strategy. So we're focusing on our talent, which makes our workforce. We're focusing on supplier diversity, so really engaging and doing meaningful businesses with diverse suppliers. And also through the work of our marketplace, that's kind of where our customers are, right? We're creating culturally relevant products, services, and also experiences and help to create equitable access to capital for small businesses. Um, and we're also advancing economic and racial equity in our communities through philanthropic. Our social impact strategy is aligned to the marketplace and community pillars, and it guides what we're doing in the foundation, marketing, and some of other the other teams to help the, the persistent historical wealth gap in our economic outcome for women, people of color, people with disabilities, and low income communities. On the next slide, um, I want to share a little bit about what U.S. Bank has done last year. Our DEI work really touched many areas. Um, as you can see, kind of a, the whole broad scope that we have covered. Um, last, um, the last couple of years with the pandemic, right, um, there's been increased violence against Asian, American, and Pacific Islander. Um, we also have done different programming internally where we are really focusing on diversity and inclusion. So one program that I want to just mention calling up really high level is what we call Journey to Inclusion. So essentially Journey to Inclusion is a wealth of resources um, and it's a mix of TED Talks, research papers, articles, from various different diversity lenses that help all of our employees expand their knowledge around diversity and inclusion a little bit further. Um, we've also done a number of other different things. Um, the DEI team and the Disability BRG also have been influencing our DEI effort for the additional project in the last few years. And Emily will share more about what she does as the disability and accessibility consultant. On the next slide here, uh, the work to build diversity, equity, and inclusion into our operating rhythm is really more of a team effort. And we call this one US bank effort. So our it starts with our executive leader who helps set the tone and the vision at the top and the DEI team who helps set the strategy. And we have many partners across the brand, um, such as HR, such as multicultural marketing, right? They help build different programs that are targeting different diverse communities. And we also have people leaders who are key to our employee experience to ensure that our diverse talent are being developed and we can retain them. We also work with DEI champions. So DEI champions are different senior leaders in each of our line of business who are ambassadors of DEI and help influence inclusion further down in the organization. I have a couple slides left. Um, this is where I wanna touch a little bit about US Bank Access Commitment. So Access Commitment is our US Bank long-term strategy to help close the racial wealth gap. 
some of the commitment that we focus on building wealth for specific uh, segments, for example, um, it started in February of 21 with a focus first on black community, because according to McKinsey uh, research, the data has shown that the black community has the largest wealth gap in the US. So we are starting with the community that have the biggest disparity. Since the nature of our identity are multifaceted, what we are doing to support one community is also likely to benefit people with other identity with other communities as well. So for example, someone who's identified as black, perhaps a deaf woman, they may see support from us through initiative beyond those groups, um, but also supporting that black community. So for example, our efforts to hire people with disabilities and our commitment to advance women and our effort to also um, put more resources in term, um, for people with disabilities, right? All of that essentially is wo interwoven together. And by the same token, closing the racial wealth gap by building wealth through targeted efforts to support black communities will benefit all Americans by the end by increasing our GDP and creating more opportunities across the board. Um, so I touched on already about access commitment. This is just to kind of give you a quick overview in terms of uh, our various projects that touch on access commitment. And then on the next slide, if you want to learn more about US Bank access commitment, you can go to our main website, usbank.com backslash access commitment and search more about that. And I wanna close my section by sharing a quote from our CEO. This work is long-term. We're committed to being part of the solution. And we believe that access to financial education, career development and capital creates opportunities for systemic change. I'm gonna turn it over to Emily Nuremberg. Emily? Yeah, thanks Astrid. Um... My name is Emily Normberg. As mentioned, I'm a disability and accessibility consultant within human resources um, at US Bank. I'm a white female. I have dark brown shoulder length hair. I'm wearing a blue blazer and a white blouse. And I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about employee accessibility and accommodation. So let's begin by taking a look at our employees and the need for accommodation. So Kelly, if you could go to the next slide. So according to the CDC, one in four or 26% of adults experience some type of disability. As we consider our workforce, um, research from the National Institute of Health shows that 22% of employees should be considered accommodation sensitive, meaning they would benefit from a disability related accommodation. An estimated 47 to 58 percent of those employees um, that would benefit from accommodation do not have them. And the National Institute of Health helps us understand the positive impact of workplace access as accommodation sensitive employees are 13 percent more likely to still be working four years later if they received accommodations than those who did not. So if we needed a why to support the need for a disability inclusive work environment, we have it right here. So we know that disability is a natural part of the human experience and that all companies should have strategies that embed access and inclusion as part of the work experience. Not only does this help attract talent, but it helps retain talent. And I would say perhaps most important of all is that as employers, we want our employees to feel confident and empowered to create the environment they need to excel at the work that they were hired to do. So if we know that workplace access is important and we know that it plays a role in employee retention, the question becomes how do we create workplace access? So if we move to the next slide, we're gonna start talking about some different ways that we can provide disability access. So one strategy is through the provision of reasonable accommodations. So this strategy is necessary to meet our obligation to provide equal access as required by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it's a vital piece of the infrastructure that we need 
to support employees with disabilities. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about reasonable accommodation basics. So very simply, a reasonable accommodation is a change or an adjustment to an environment. Reasonable accommodations are going to include a range of possibilities because access is going to look different for everyone and we must consider access requests on a case by case basis. So the goal of a reasonable accommodation is to reduce or eliminate a disability related barrier um, with the goal of allowing an employee to perform the essential functions of their job. A reasonable accommodation is not intended or designed to reduce or eliminate essential functions, but really we're focusing on ensuring that equitable opportunity to engage in employment. Finally, a reasonable accommodation is not going to create an undue hardship or a significant burden to a company. So next, I wanna share a high level overview of the accommodation request process. Now my intention here is not to bring anyone into the weeds of the process, but I do wanna take a moment to recognize that people fill various roles throughout a company and lots of folks can be on those front lines of disability disclosure moments or accommodation requests. So the really the key takeaway here is to simply be aware of the mechanisms that your company has in place to support employees as they request a disability related accommodation. So the very start of the request process begins with a request. Um, and our request can be submitted by an employee, it can be submitted by a manager, or really any other individual that has been made aware of the need for a reasonable accommodation. From there, we move into the interactive process. And this is really the heart of the reasonable accommodation request process. The ADA does require accommodation requests to be considered on a case by case basis so that meaningful access can be achieved. So in this interactive process, we're looking to gather information that helps us understand the impact of the disability condition the essential functions of the role. And we also begin to explore um, potential accommodations that would mitigate the barriers dis disclosed while also preserving the essential functions of the position. So finally, we arrive at the accommodation determination. So after considering the full range of facts, an accommodation is selected and implemented. We also then need to periodically revisit the accommodation that's been implemented to ensure that it continues to be effective at mitigating the barrier disclosed. Um, so accommodation, and, and Kelly, if you want to jump to the next slide, um, accommodation is required by the ADA, and it is one strategy that we can use to create access, but it should be our only strategy. So a limitation of relying solely on accommodation is that it does place the burden on the individual with a disability. So another way that companies can mitigate potential barriers to access is by designing with disability accessibility in mind. So accessibility means focusing on proactively removing disability related barriers. So when we design with disability accessibility as a priority, we can often reduce the need for individualized accommodations and we also often create better experiences for a wide range of people. So companies really that excel at creating inclusive workplace environments for employees with disabilities have adopted a both and mindset. So they seek to proactively design for disability inclusion, but they also have a clear and effective strategy for responding to individualized accommodation requests. So next we're going to move into um, some practice. And so we're going to, the following slides are going to contain a lot of information. And to be very clear, I'm not going to cover all of this information in exhaustive detail, but these next four slides, I believe, are available as a handout. So if I buzz over something, please don't panic. You will have this as a handout. Um, so really, we're going to take a brief look at different disability access scenarios so we can practice this concept of designing for inclusive access and implementing reasonable accommodation. And the goal really is then to understand how these two elements can work together to provide holistic access. So let's start with looking at access and accommodation considerations for visual disabilities. 
So something that we can do um, as a matter of inclusive access is we can provide accessible routes of travel. So we can remove any obstacles, we can describe a room layout. So for an individual who experiences a visual disability, we've removed any hazards with, with chairs or bags in the aisles that could trip or cause harm to that individual. It's also good for a wide range of users. I don't know if you've ever experienced walking into a meeting room and your face is down in your cell phone or you're digging through your bag, um, looking for a file or a writing utensil, or perhaps you're just deeply engaged in conversation with a colleague. Again, removing those tripping hazards is beneficial to people in different situations as well. Now, something that we might want to think about through the lens of accommodation is Braille format handouts. So the thing to bear in mind is that not all people with visual disabilities read or use Braille. So it might not be something that we would want to have available as inclusive access, but something where we clearly want to have a defined pathway for responding to requests and then procuring Braille format materials. So let's next take a look at access and accommodation considerations for hearing disabilities. So something that we can do in the name of inclusive access is talk about auto caption features in our video meeting platforms. Um, so for an individual that is deaf or hard of hearing, this provides an alternative option for accessing auditory content in meetings. But for a wide range of users, auto captions can offer benefit as well. For some folks, it's helpful to see the, the caption stream. It helps us remain engaged in the content in a meeting. If we're working in a quiet environment or in a shared workspace, we have that opportunity to reduce distractions to others. Now, something that we might consider then through the lens of reasonable accommodation is providing American Sign Language interpreting. So not everyone who experiences a hearing loss um, may know or use ASL. So it might not be something we'd want to focus on um, always for inclusive access, particularly if we're working with a known audience. But again, we want to have that pathway in place so we can be responsive and deploy a solution when it's needed or requested. So next we can look at um, access and accommodation considerations for speech related disabilities. So something um, that is universally inclusive and accessible for all is minimizing background noise. So if a person were to experience some type of speech production related disability that impacted their ability to speak at loud volumes or their vocal stamina, minimizing those distractions and background noise can really help reduce the amount of times that a person might be asked to repeat information. It's also helpful for other folks. We're in the era of, of online meetings. And so it's very common for us to say, if you're not speaking, make sure your microphone is muted. We're seeking to reduce those background noises, um, making sure everyone can access the content and that the focus can remain on the speaker. Now, something that we might want to consider through the lens of accommodation is providing additional time. So let's imagine that we're in an interview experience with a candidate who has a speech related disability that impacts their rate of speech. The goal is to make sure that we fully understand a candidate's skills and job knowledge for a particular position. And so we need to make sure that the experience that we're offering allows that person the full opportunity to completely and fully demonstrate their knowledge and skills. So additional time might be a reasonable accommodation in that scenario. Last, let's take a look at access and accommodation considerations for invisible disabilities. Something that we can do that's broadly inclusive of a wide range of users um, is presenting information in multiple modalities. So we all have different ways of acquiring information. Sometimes it's a matter of preference, and sometimes it's a matter of how a specific disability condition impacts our capacity to concentrate, think, learn, read. Um, so presenting information in a range of different formats allows individuals to flex into the way that works best for them. Now, something that we might consider through the lens of reasonable accommodation um, could be an opportunity to communicate another way. So let's imagine a scenario where a team participates in a weekly roundtable exercise where we offer report outs of projects that we're working on and activities that are in progress. Um, we may wish to 
offer an alternative modality for, for those report outs for a person who experiences an invisible disability that impacts their ability to communicate. So having um, an opportunity to provide something in writing could be a reasonable accommodation um, in that type of scenario. So I will close out with this thought. We know that um, disability access is often a journey and it's not a destination. And we certainly know that it's not a checkbox activity. So some of the strategic work um, that lies ahead for advancing and continuing to um, increase accessibility for employees with disabilities at US Bank includes executing on a set of internal digital accessibility guidelines. These guidelines are intended to ensure that employees have the capacity to easily and independently access all of the technology that powers our company. Um, soon we'll be uh, launching a required training for people leaders or managers. And the focus of this training is disability awareness and workplace accessibility. And finally, as a companion piece um, to the required training, we'll also be launching what is called an accessibility playbook. And this playbook is designed to provide a brief, tactical just-in-time guidance to managers as they navigate matters of disability disclosure, access, and accommodation in the workplace. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. I'm going to pass the floor over to my colleague Kelly, who's going to take us into a deeper dive of the disability BRG at US Bank. Great. Thanks, Emily. Hello everyone, I am Kelly Risser. I'm the Accessibility Banking Director at US Bank. I'm also the chair of our Global Disability Business Resource Group. For a visual description, I am a white middle-aged woman wearing glasses with shoulder-ish length brown hair and a light, wearing a light purple top today. To start with, um, the business resource group structure at US Bank. Let's look at the overall structure of what we have. We have 10 business resource groups and within those 10 resource groups, we have over 115 chapters. In the, the chapters, or I'm sorry, the resource groups we have are Black Heritage, European Inclusion, Asian Heritage, our Development Network, Disability, Indigenous Peoples, Nosotros Latinos, Proud to Serve, Spectrum, which is our LBGTQ+, and then US Bank Women. Within those various BRGs, you'll see that the chapters, they all have a global chapter, um, but then many of the groups also have what we call local or market chapters. Um, the disability group, which is in the center of the screen, we just at this point have a global chapter formally, and then we have our focus chapters, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later. All of the global chapters are virtual and they support employees worldwide. So let's talk a little bit about our business resource groups, what they are um, at US Bank, they are completely employee-led. Each global chapter is supported by an executive sponsor on our managing committee. And our BRGs have extensive business impact, which includes serving as a resource and helping us to foster a diverse and inclusive workplace, developing employees, celebrating culture and first-person experiences, and promoting action for positive change, and bringing together employees who have similar backgrounds, experiences, or interests, and their allies. So in essence, what our business resource groups do is drive inclusion. They do this through bringing employees together, providing professional development, celebrating culture and community, supporting recruiting and business initiatives, and fostering an inclusive workplace. So now let's look closer at our disability business resource group. Our disability business resource group has an objective of creating an outlet for employees with disabilities and supporters to network, learn, develop, and contribute powerfully to our company and communities. We started this group five years ago, October of 2017, and we've grown to over 2,300 members. We host company-wide events throughout the year, um, 
typically our biggest months are April for Autism Acceptance Month, May for Mental Health Month, July for the ADA anniversary, and then October for Disability Employment Awareness Month. So we launched in October, starting with Mallory Wegenin, the 2012 Paralympic gold medalist as our keynote speaker. Since that time, we've had Michigan Supreme Court Justice Richard Bernstein and Boston Marathon bombing survivor Adrian Haslett as some of our keynote speakers in October. We engage employees through our focus chapters and support circles, through partnership events with other BRGs. We do a lot of intersectionality programming. We have numerous development and volunteer opportunities throughout the year. And we have a very active virtual community where we have employees sharing their stories through our blog, which is on our SharePoint site, through our Yammer community, um, and we also hold book clubs and discussions. We also make a point of creating impact in the community. In Minneapolis, they sponsor, US Bank sponsors the sensory friendly programming for the Minnesota Children's Theater. And we have community partnerships that bring individuals with disabilities into the US Bank workplace. So in, at the start of this year, actually, all of the BRGs introduced, were introduced to three new actionable uh, focuses. And those are connect, share, and grow. So all BRGs share these three focuses. The words are meant to inspire a sense of purpose for our board members and to identify as value to our employees. If a new employee asks why they should get involved, we can clearly say it's because BRT, BRGs will help you connect, share, and grow. So BRGs also have the ability to add a fourth focus that is meaningful to their BRG. In the case of disability, we know that accessibility is what fosters equity for people with disabilities. So accessibility is our fourth focus. And each of these focuses have a director on our board who oversees that focus. So we're gonna look a little bit more detail into each of these focuses and what that looks like in the disability BRG space. So starting with Connect, for the disability BRG, our Connect goal is to increase representation and engagement of employees with disabilities in our group. We do this by highlighting key awareness days and months, by engaging senior leaders to share their first person disability experiences, and by holding panel discussions throughout the year, especially during our key months that I mentioned earlier. We also promote intersectional courageous conversations between our BRGs. Mary Brown is our Connect Director, and Mary is actually, um, she's on the call today, she'll be part of our panel discussion, but Mary is within our um, consumer and business banking space, so within the branches. So it's a really nice fit for Mary, both her professional role and also her role within our board. And you'll see that theme continue as we look at the other focuses. So for SHARE, we have a SHARE goal of developing employee support of the disability community. We do this by promoting disability in programs on mentoring and disability-owned business entity vendor networking. We spotlight a disability-owned business every month to raise awareness. And right now, how we're doing this is we're focusing on retail businesses that have an online presence for the greatest impact to our employees. And we share those within our, our groups SharePoint site. So we have a business directory on our SharePoint site. Often um, what we've done is reached out to the disability owned businesses and asked them if they'd be willing to share with us a unique code that our employees can enter so that we're able to gauge the level of impact that we have as an organization um, with those businesses. And it's really been, um, I think a wonderful experience. Our employees really like it. And this is something we just started this year, but our directory, as you can imagine, is growing um, quite a bit. So we also encourage volunteering focused on the disability community. Where we have board members within certain markets, they will partner with our development networks to, to plan those in-person volunteer opportunities. But we also have a volunteer portal that our employees can access and there are virtual volunteer um, opportunities as well. And we'll promote those virtual ones within our member meetings and our newsletters to let employees know about them. 
And then additionally, we, we connect with campus recruiting and segment marketing, again, to foster those relationships with diverse businesses. The connection here, so our share director is Robin Sullivan, and she is actually in procurement. So in her day job, she works with our vendors. So it works really well, but that's also the focus that she has within the Disability Business Resource Group. From a grow goal perspective, we are looking to increase disability inclusion in uh, DEI efforts, leadership development and communications, amplifying the voice of employees with disabilities to affect change. We do this by holding mentoring events and pairing employees with disabilities with leaders, providing member development and visibility through speaking opportunities and blog spotlights. We're firm believers in nothing about us without us. And we provide that platform for our employees with disabilities to share their experiences and make sure that their voice is heard and amplify their voices. We also overview the accommodations process and related resources for people leaders to strengthen the support of employees with disabilities and also for our members to make sure they're aware of the resources that are available to them at the bank. The connection here is that Sarah, our GROW Director, is in recruiting. So she has a really good tie to employee development, um, hiring initiatives, and everything HR related. And then that fourth focus for us that's unique to the Disability BRG accessibility, we promote equity and inclusion through accessibility. We share accessibility resources with the board and other BRGs. We really started this effort um, back in 2020. We've met with all the other BRGs and we're very proud to say that they've adopted um, accessible formats for their newsletters. They all ask within their event registrations if accommodations are needed. So we've really seen um, our BRGs embracing accessibility. We monitor accommodation request adoption and event planning. So we're, we're watching that. We're working with the other BRGs if they have questions. And we work with DEI to update resources um, for event accessibility. We model what accessible events look like. We always make a point when we start our meetings to point out the accessible features in the virtual meeting space. And we'll share that scripting and that information with other BRG leaders whenever we can. And we also look to increase the use of accessibility features in Office 365 across the company. So we promote um, the accessibility checker, we promote the accessible features in Teams, and we work with all the various groups in the company to, to get that awareness out and to help people take action to make sure that their content is accessible. In this case, Brian Francisco, our accessibility director, is in learning development. So he also has a strong tie to the work he's doing on the BRG. And now moving into the focus chapters, I won't talk too much about this because I don't want to steal the spotlight from our panelists, but our focus chapters are led by disability reps. These are individuals who have first person experiences with the disabilities that are with the focus of their chapter. They incorporate support circles and committees. They support the strategic work that is set by the global board and they meet quarterly with the global board to make sure that we maintain alignment throughout the year. And with that, um, we will stop for questions before we move into part two of our presentation. So Kelly, there was a question on the Q&A why were the panelists using visual descriptions? That's a great question. So um, by providing a visual description, we really are being inclusive and helping individuals with vision disabilities to, um, to understand what we look like and, and um, you know, some of the information that they aren't able to consume, but other people just kind of take for granted because they can see our video feed. So we're happy to provide that image description as um, an inclusive practice. Another question that came in, what were the four months you focus on again and how did you settle on the four months within the disability BRG? Absolutely. Well, I will tell you that when we first started five years ago, October was our, our main month. So Disability Employment Awareness Month. 
um, obviously because that really is very broad and encompassing and supports the entire disability community. As time went on, um, based on the experiences and um, focuses within our board and what our member interest was in is where we added some of the other months. So um, we added mental health month in May pretty early on um, because mental health is a big focus of our group and we have a very large mental health focused chapter. And so it made sense for us to do that programming and it's actually a really great month for us to do a lot of intersectional work too with other BRGs. Um, we've partnered with our proud to serve military and veterans. We've partnered with um, Black heritage, Asian heritage, nosotros Latinos, um, and been able to, to really, um, I think, create some broad impact across the company for that month. Um, autism acceptance we added in April um, because mainly starting out because we had a lot of caregivers who were involved with our BRG and a lot of caregivers of um, children with autism. So that's kind of where we started from an education perspective. And since that time, we are now just about ready to stand up a neurodiversity chapter. So we're going to see a lot more first person experience um, sharing within um, Autism Acceptance Month. We do hold a member meeting every month though. So we do try to focus on the awareness days of any given month at any given time and share information. As you all know, the disability community is very broad and diverse and we wanna make sure we're, we're giving equal attention and information as much as we can for all the various focuses within the disability community. All right, this next question is for Emily what disability documentation is required to request an accommodation? Yeah, so it's difficult to say exactly what documentation is required. Again, we're looking at things on a case-by-case -case basis. So the purpose of disability documentation is not necessarily to understand the diagnostic codes or the specific condition that a person may experience, but more so to focus on the limitations that show up for that person, particularly in a workplace setting. So if we understand what those impacts are, that allows us to determine and better understand what kind of accommodation would effectively address that particular limitation in the workplace setting. So it's very case by case basis in the instance of how how we work through documentation requirements. All right, the next question, what does inclusion look like in a construction company? Um, I've never worked in, an inclu uh, in a construction company before, but I would say, I mean, an approach that any company can take is really, first of all, understanding your workplace, your what your talent makeup looks like, right? essentially understanding each and everybody's need, right? One of the biggest thing is always gender diversity and then also racial diversity, but also understand the makeup of your employee who might have disability, who probably have different sexual preferences, right? So there's different way and being inclusive, creating that sense of belonging. It's really about listening and understanding the diverse need of your employee population. Kelly, Emily, I want to invite you guys to chime in also if you have other ideas on creating a, a belonging and inclusion culture. I think yeah, that's I'm... really good. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Go Emily. You got, you got it. Go for it. I was just gonna say, I think, I think that was really a, a great, great advice, Astrid. I would add to that, that, you know, wherever possible, um, listen to your employees and hear those first person experiences. Cause I think um, way back when, when we looked to when uh, diversity and inclusion was first starting out, it sometimes I think companies tried to do the right thing and were making decisions on behalf of a, of a particular group instead of inviting that group to be part of that conversation. So being part of the conversation, um, inviting your employees into that conversation is a really good way to go about getting started and making sure that you're not unintentionally excluding any, any group from your discussion or your planning. Emily? Really, I was just um, going to say much of what Kelly just said, and it's really making sure that 
that it's part of the conversation, right? That there's there's a an awareness throughout the company, and that often starts by by talking about things, developing procedures, um, making sure that folks feel supported by having well-developed mechanisms in place to support when a, a need or an access requirement or an inclusion requirement comes up. All right, last question. Kelly, can you share a little bit more how the focus chapter work and what type of things do they share out in those groups? I mean, I believe this will be answered in the panel, right, in the second half. Kelly? It will be. So I, I'm going to hold on that question. And if there's still questions at the end, we are allowing time at the end as well to answer anything that didn't get addressed by our panelists. But I, I don't want to make it too repetitive or steal words from our, our panelists. So we'll hold on that one. All right. With that, I'm going to close the first part and I'm going to hand it off to you, Kelly, I believe. Yep. Sounds great. Thanks, Astrid. Okay, so I'm just gonna put this slide up very briefly so that I can provide just a high level introduction to part two of our event today. So the next section is gonna be really a very um, informal discussion with our focus chapter leads of the disability BRG. So I wanna share with you who our panelists are, although I'm going to have them introduce themselves, I did wanna give you just high level names and, and how they're involved with the Disability BRG. So our panelists today are Mary Brown. Mary is an Assistant Vice President and Branch Manager, and she is the lead of our Physical Disabilities Chapter. Kristen Trumbull is a Regulatory Review Rep, and she is the lead of our Mental Health Conditions Chapter. Jane Wiesner is a records manager and she is the co-lead of our deaf and hard of hearing chapter. Kelly Sullivan is an assistant vice president and product owner and she is the co-lead of the deaf and hard of hearing chapter. Debbie Hausler is a project manager for our talent and culture enablement team and she is the co-lead of our caregivers chapter. And then Christy Bartlett is a vice president product manager and the co-lead of our caregivers chapter. So with that, I am going to stop sharing so that we can see everybody's beautiful faces on full screen, and then we will move into the panel discussion. So I'll just give everyone just a minute to get their cameras and mics going before I start asking questions. Okay, switch to gallery view so I can see everybody's Lovely faces, and I think we are ready to get started. So I'm going to start, I'll start with Mary, since I introduced you first, Mary. Okay. What inspired you to get involved in the Disability Business Resource Group? Well, I am a person who uses a wheelchair. So when this group came about, and I read it in um, different uh, things that came across my desk, uh, being in the retail branch, environment, I thought it was so important to get um, information out to branches, to leaders of people in branches, and to make that connection between the branch world. So initially, that was my um, reason for coming on the board and, and becoming more involved with the disability group. Great. Thanks, Mary. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move to Jane. How about you, Jane? Thanks, Kelly. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I'm a white female with blue eyes. I have mm, shoulder length brown hair and I'm wearing a um, yellow top with a blue blazer. Um, what inspired me, what's interesting about this question for me is I did not think of myself as someone with a disability at first because I related that to someone like Mary who needed a wheelchair and then quickly discovered I um, do relate to other people with disabilities. I am deaf and hard of hearing myself. I do wear a cochlear device, as well as I grew up with a, with a family with lots of mental illness. So I really relate to this community and I'm just thrilled to be part of it um, and found many, many, many connections through the disability BRG. 
Wonderful. Thanks, Jane. I will move to Kelly next. So we'll kind of stick with the chapter. So Kelly, if you'd like to share. Sure. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, just for reference, I am a white female in my mid 40s. Um, I have long brown hair with blonde highlights to cover up my grays. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a navy blue top on. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to get involved um, with the deaf and hard of hearing chapter is in my previous role, I was actually a business line trainer. Um, and I was kind of um, just put into, into that role naturally. And I never received um, any education or experiences on accessibility. So I wanted to improve my skill set, um, hear other people's experiences, um, what they deal with on a daily basis, and just basically see stuff from a different viewpoint instead of having that straight and narrow viewpoint um, and just better understand how and why uh, what other individuals may be experiencing. Um, I'm very thankful for this, uh, specifically the deaf and hard of hearing community. Jane has been absolutely wonderful. Um, but it's, it's definitely made me make some adjustments. Um, if I ever do a presentation now, something I always like to incorporate are the accessibility options, just in case someone's not aware uh, to bring it to light to make their experience better. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. Okay, next, let's go to Kristen Trumbull. Kristen, can you share um, why you got involved with the Disability Business Resource Group? Yep, thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm Kristen, uh, white female, very long, dark brown hair streaked with some gray, uh, wearing glasses and a maroon shirt. Um, and I've always been passionate about DEI to begin with. I think it's something really crucial to a successful workplace. Um, but really at the same time, I always had a sense I couldn't fully be myself at work. There was something, a huge part of my life story I hid from, from the, my closest coworkers um, out of fear of judgment. So when I heard about the BRG, I wondered how, other men, how many other people felt like they also had to hide or minimize a disability um, or an aspect of themselves so others wouldn't see them as different or less than. And instead of now being different or less than, instead this group gives us a community to celebrate those things. Um, those things are now, they're part of who we are as individuals. They're not a deficit and instead something that's an important part of what makes us us. Um, and then this is also a place where I felt like maybe my lived experience with mental health conditions could help educate and support others. I love that. And I think, you know, one of the things at the bank, we um, talk a lot about bringing our authentic selves to work. So I think it's wonderful that the, the business resource group has helped so many of us to be able to do that. All right, so I'm gonna move over to Debbie, if you'd like to share um, why you got involved with the Disability Business Resource Group. I would love to. Hi, I'm Debbie Hausler. I am a white, middle-aged female with um, salt and pepper hair, and I am wearing a short sleeve green t-shirt. Um, I'm so excited to be here today because when I first, actually first learned about the disability BRG, which was maybe only about four years ago, um, I started joining some of the events that they had, and I was lucky enough to be on the same team as Kelly. And she, so she knew my story, and um, I am a caregiver to my husband who has an incurable autoimmune disease. And so when, as the disability BRG decided to continue to grow, she asked me if I would be interested in becoming a caregiver rep for the BRG. And I jumped on the chance. My passion is to help other caregivers um, and allies of caregivers to make it through that journey while taking care of themselves and um, so this was a great opportunity for me and, I, and in a way that I could connect with other employees who are caregivers, as well as, like Kelly said, bring my whole self to work. Thanks, Debbie. And Christy, not, last but not least, if you'd like to share how you got involved with the Disability BRG. Hi, thanks, Kelly. Hi, I'm Christy Bartlett. 
Um, I am a white female with long red hair, um, blue eyes, and I wear glasses, and I'm wearing a short sleeve black top today. Um, so I got involved with uh, the Disability Business Resource Group and with um, the caregiving chapter. My son several years ago was battling cancer. And during his journey, um, I felt very alienated and alone. And I met many families with children with differing abilities and in various states of caregiving for their loved ones and really learned that sharing our experiences and resources can be life changing at really pivotal moments um, in in our various journeys. And so a few years ago, uh, Debbie, I, I, um, I'm part of the enterprise innovation team. And we were working, I was helping out with um, the very first caregiver summit that maybe we'll talk about a little bit later. And uh, that's how I learned about the Disability Business Resource Group. And uh, Debbie and I met one another and really jumped into both uh, supporting caregivers and supporting the Disability Business Resource Group and community. And it's been amazing. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe that I forgot November and Caregiver Summit as part of my main months. I'm so sorry. That is huge, huge, huge and wonderful programming. So for everyone listening, please add November Caregivers as a very big month within the Disability BRG. Um, so next, let's talk a little bit about um, have each of you sh remind the audience what group you lead and then talk a little bit about the dynamics of your group. But before we get into that question, I'm just going to provide a little background to everyone. I mentioned earlier that um, we restructured at the end of last year, beginning of this year. So what that means is our diversity, equity and inclusion team um, had worked with all the BRGs to restructure the format. You know, we learned after COVID and everything went virtual that with 115 chapters, it quickly became very unruly with 115 chapters all trying to jump in and do virtual programming and uh, promote to a limited number of employees with limited hours in the day to attend this fabulous programming. So we have our global chapters now for each of the BRGs. And then within that, there are the, the local chapters that report up to the global, or in our case, the focus chapters that report up to the global. So focus chapters are really a, a new thing for our um, BRG, just started this year. And we had our disability reps on our board who um, moved to lead those focus chapters. So that's just a little bit of background on the history of how the focus chapters started. Um, and although, all of the wonderful people you see today on this panel have been hold, holding support circles and committees, leading those initiatives for the Disability BRG for the last several years. It was really this year that we've more formalized those initiatives into chapters. So if I left anything out of there, please correct me or, or add to that. But I'm gonna just jump, go in reverse order now. So I'm gonna go to, to Debbie and Christy for this one. So, um, if you just want to share a little bit about the dynamic of your of your chapter and tell everyone what chapter it is that you lead again. So Christy and I are co-leads for the caregiver chapter. And so when I think of the word dynamic, because I would like I think about what is a, a driving force, like what moves you forward. And Honestly, I just say the dynamic part of our group are the people. Um, we have such a diverse, uh, we have such diverse personalities in our group and we have, and the purpose or the reason why we are caregivers is again, so diverse. Um, but my favorite part is that when we have a conversation, um, we have such a common line because although you caregive for different reasons, you are care you are still a caregiver. And so there's so many commonalities, even though there's so much diversity that um, I think that's my probably one of my favorite parts of our group. Chrissy, what would you add? 
Yeah, I think I would. Uh, so I'll add just a little bit on top of that and talk a little bit about our mission. Uh, Debbie and I worked a lot on this earlier this year. So really our mission is to create a compassionate compu community to support caregiver well-being. So ultimately, we're really wanting to celebrate and encourage and then provide resources to every caregiver across U.S. Bank. And I echo exactly what Debbie said. Uh, people are coming in, in various stages of their journey, some very vulnerable, some have been um, on their journey for a while, really open to sharing, collaborating, um, learning from one another to really build and help each other, um, you know, grow. And the other thing that really stands out to me is, is the unlikely connections that I know Debbie and I have made that we never would have made to really support others and help them uh, get, you know, get to, you know, if, if it's a good place or a stable place or, or uh, whatever it may be for them. Well, I also love um, some of the other initiatives that have come out of your group that are related to caregiving, like the self care component, right? Like I just think, you know, it's really great to see the ways that employees engage with your chapter and the different ideas that get brought forward. Absolutely. So, very cool. We talk yeah, about that a lot. All right. Self -care. About how... Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say that, um, you know, with, with caregiving, it's very difficult to care for others if you're not caring for yourself. So that also uh, became a, a very apparent and a focus uh, for some of the work that we do do uh, because you you as a caregiver need that, that energy and drive to be able to support those that you love. I love that. All right, so Kristen. If you want to share, remind everyone your chapter and talk a little bit about the dynamic of your group. Yep. Um, so I lead uh, mental health conditions and we have kind of two main aspects to the group. We have a, a committee uh, that plans events, um, you know, panel discussions or webinars and things like that, that we open up to the full company. Um, and then we also have the support circle, which is a confidential discussion group. And the support circle, I'd say, is what's really grown exponentially um, in the last year or so. Um, there's really a huge need for people to have a place where they can come together and talk openly, um, whether it's about their mental health challenges or their family members with them. Um, so that's something that's just become um, a really important part of that, that chapter. That's great. And I will say that uh, mental health conditions, many of the members have shared their, their first person experiences either through panel discussions or on our um, blog on our SharePoint site as well. So um, it's great to see um, that, that vulnerability and that openness that people have and that comfort level that they have to share and know that they're supported in, in, in sharing. Yeah, and every time somebody shares one, it, it seems like it, it kind of has a ripple effect and more people become comfortable speaking openly when one person starts the conversation. Absolutely. And, and from that perspective, too, I have to say thank you to all of you, because I know that you all shared your first person experiences when you joined the Disability BRG board, and you helped to pave the way for others to do that. So um, thank you for what you've done as well. Okay, so let's go to Jane and Kelly. I'm going to kind of group you both together since you both co-lead the chapter, but if you can share about your chapter and just what the dynamic of your chapter is like. Thank you, Kelly. Um, well, the deaf and hard of hearing community started off very slow. In fact, I think there was only three of us for a couple of months that would meet and talk about our struggles and what it was, um, how hard it was sometimes to be in a meeting like this and be able to hear the presenters. Um, 
tools have improved to help hearing um, resources. And we've talked about, we've shared experiences about um, what headsets work best, what hearing aids work best, um, how can we get closed captioning the message out there to everybody to always, you know, have the avail availability to turn it on if we need closed captioning, um, things like that. So we've had a lot of really good discussions, but I'm going to circle to what both Christy, Debbie, and Kristen said. Just we have now grown to almost 40 people, and um, and that's just in, I would say, the last year. We started about a very small handful of people a year ago, and now in, we're up to 40 members. And in a company of our size, to find connections or individuals who share the deaf and hard of hearing experience would have never happened without a BRG connection. Um, so now we do know each other, and we do know each other by name, and we're, we're having fun with it. Or I mean, once in a while, we have a unique experience, we share it, we get to laugh with each other about it because we can relate. Um, so that's been a really blessing for us. So we have people who know us and kind of what, like what Kristen says, you don't feel alone. There's people out there um, who has that experience and can share it with you, talk to you and take care of yourself with it. I um, mean, I do have a wonderful co-lead Kelly. She's been a great advocate on the team too. So I will turn it over and see if she has anything to add. Yeah, that, that's perfect, Jane. I feel like we're a small but mighty group, uh, maybe compared to some of the other um, focus chapters. But um, I do thoroughly enjoy our monthly conversations. Um, just so everyone is aware, I am an advocate for the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, so even though I, I can't fully relate um, I still enjoy listening to everyone's experience and, you know, what their challenges are and trying to find solutions for them if needed. Um, and something I worked on too, uh, to have a central location for everything is we do have a SharePoint site. Um, it's only given out to members. Uh, you have to be granted permission in order to access it. So it's not like anybody in the bank uh, can come and access it. So um, it's turned out to be a great resource for the group. Um, that way, if, if you miss a meeting uh, for that month, you can go back and uh, look at our PowerPoint slide or see if any new resources have been added. So we're doing good. <laughs> That's awesome. That's some great growth too, to go from three to 40. I like it. Congratulations. And, and you brought up a really good point, I, I think. Um, the other leaders will probably talk about it a little bit, but each group has a way to virtually connect with their chapters, whether it's through Yammer, Teams, um, SharePoint. Um, we make full use of, of all the different platforms at the bank. So, all right, Mary, if you'd like to share about your chapter and the dynamic of your chapter. Yes, thank you. So I lead the physical disabilities group. As I shared before, I, do, I am a person who uses a wheelchair and scooter, and I have a handicapped van now. So I've become very independent in the last year, which is so awesome for me. And I love to share my experiences. So when Kelly asked me to continue to lead this group, I absolutely said yes. I do have a co-chair with me, Andy Elliott, who is actually the vice president of our global board. And um, she has dystonia, which means she is not able to speak. So in a lot of the meetings and when we share things, I am her voice and I'm so honored to do that on her behalf because she is such a strong, strong, intelligent woman. And I love that she's part of our group and continues to be a strong leader in our group. Um, when I am in the Cleveland market, and like I said, I'm a branch manager. So when I would go to manager meetings and when Cleveland Columbus would get together, there'd be about 80 of us in a room and I was the only one that looked like me. I was the only one in a wheelchair and you always get the people, oh, can I help you? What can I do? And though I appreciate that, I just wanted to be more inclusive in that group and make sure that people knew my story and know kind of how to treat me and how to treat other people that are in my situation. So I really love this group that we put together. And like the other ones, we started with two people, just Andy and I, and then it has grown from there. And then we got two more people to join 
and so forth and so on. And we just did our third year in a row of the ADA celebration. And after that presentation, it was like a takeoff. So we had several people join our group after that as well. So we've got 25, 28 people in our group right now. And when we do have our calls, there might be five, six, 12 people on it. So it still remains a smaller group. We have a conference call once a month and at the last Tuesday of the month. Um, it is a safe space. And I always tell people this is not recorded. It's not shared anywhere. So people can truly talk about whatever they want. We usually do a go around and do introductions, especially if there's some newer people that have joined and they kind of want to get to know our story and what we do. And then it's kind of open for business. We don't really have an agenda. Usually something within uh, people introducing themselves will spark a conversation. And I always tell them when I when it gets close to the meeting, I'm like, oh, not another meeting. And then I get on that meeting and I share and I hear and I listen. And I'm like, I feel so much better for having done that. And I've taken it one step further in my uh, market specifically, and I am teaching now, and I know something's going to be rolled out here company-wide, but I took it on myself to kind of teach within my group and within my districts, um, went to my boss and said, we really need some leader instruction on how to deal with people with physical disabilities. And so um, I've started teaching uh, the packet that we have through our disability group on, di on disability etiquette, and it has been so well received. I can't even tell you how many e-cards and compliments and phone calls I get afterwards, which obviously is not the reason for doing it, but leaders are more equipped. People, I think, that have physical disabilities, people don't know how to ask them. They don't know how to approach them. They don't know what the etiquette is. So this group, especially the global board, has allowed us to be able to do that within our smaller group. So I thank you, Kelly, for being such a great leader in this group and for all the chapter leaders. So thank you. Thanks, Mary. That's you know, so invaluable, I think, to provide that disability etiquette training, especially, you know, when we're talking, the audience is mainly employees that interact with our customers on a regular basis, right? So really exactly. important that they have that comfort and they know what to ask and, you know, how to support our customers. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. So um, next, I'm going to just skip around a little bit because I think I'd like to really ask you, each of you, what advice would you have to the audience on the call today if they wanted to start focus chapters within their company? What advice would you have? Are there any, you know, learnings along the way that you'd like to share um, that would be helpful? So we'll, we'll zip back through in reverse order again. So I'll start with you, Mary. Um, I, I would say if you have a passion for it, and I know everybody that leads a group does, um, to find other people that are like people that want to start a group and want to be open and honest. Some people have mentioned bring your um, true self to work. I think that's the biggest thing for starting one of these groups is to make sure that people feel comfortable within themselves. And like I said, I'm the only person that looks like me, but getting on this chapter and getting on the global chapter, I find out, and just like people said with the deaf and hard of hearing, there's so many other people like me out there that had I not been part of this group, I wouldn't have really known the expansion of how many people like me are in this company. So I think that's the thing is just get started. Take that leap of faith, you know, do something um, to get yourself noticed and to make sure that the company knows why you want to do this, that it is a personal um, passion within yourself, I say, would, would be the biggest reason. That's great advice. Great advice. And, and you're right. We have 70,000 employees. So one in four, you know, just in the United States alone, one in four Americans has a disability. Many disabil disabilities are invisible. So there's just no way to know who has a disability. And it's been wonderful to to make those connections, you know, and being a virtual chapter to be able to have that global reach to bring people together has been really great. All right, Jane, what advice do you have? Well, I'm gonna agree with Mary, have a passion. Um, the other thing I'm gonna uh, say is be brave. Be brave to share your story, be brave to be vulnerable, be brave to connect. Um, it might feel awkward at first, but as soon as you connect, you're going to immediately feel like you have a whole community out there that you never knew was there. And you are going to be your authentic self because 
you have someone who relates to you and you're um, blessed to be part of that community and you get to know them and and um, so I guess my biggest advice is just to be brave and just go for it it does it's a little risky on you know on a personal level but at the same time what's that old saying with a great risk comes great reward so lots of great rewards wonderful that's exactly what came into my head was that saying when you said that so <laughs> love it um kelly anything else you would add nope i agree completely with everyone else um just don't be afraid to put yourself out there like jane said be brave um know you're not alone um whatever someone else is experiencing nine times out of 10, someone else has either already experienced it um, or someone else will be experiencing it. You know, I do have one question for you. Um, being involved with the, the chapter as an advocate, how has that helped you then in other aspects? Have you been able to take that advocacy back to your team and others to help grow awareness? Yes, definitely. Um, like I said, in my previous position, I was a business line trainer and um, no one had educated me on accessibility and what options are out there. Um, so being an advocate, uh, it gives me that different perspective. I still to this day make changes in how I present and um, how I design a SharePoint site or if I'm putting together a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, just making sure that it's all encompassing. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, Kristen, what advice would you share with companies wanting to start a focus chapter? Um, some of the things I would think about is, is kind of planning your structure, how you want it to work. Um, have a leadership team of at least a couple of people to help keep it organized. And then that way, you know, can kind of share the work um, and not overwhelm any one person, especially if you're gonna be doing multiple things like some of us do with doing events and also doing the support circles. So um, kind of share that. Um, be prepared for a variance and how visible people in the group wanna be. Uh, some of the people in the group are not comfortable with anyone knowing they belong to this type of, type of group. So the confidentiality ability to have that is very important. But some are gonna be on the other side of the spectrum and willing to share their stories. Like um, as Kelly mentioned, um, you know, we have a SharePoint site and things like in Yammer groups where people can share stories um, and that's, that's really been impactful to help, you know, people seeing their coworkers opening up often makes someone else more comfortable to share those, theirs. If you do have um, some sort of a communication chat channel, um, you wanna have a moderator a present, somebody who can kind of guide the group and just lay down some ground rules. Um, and especially in what we've learned is be prepared for it to grow quickly, um, be ready for capacity. Um, this is something people really want to talk about. Um, you know, this is something that is very common and um, people didn't feel like they could talk about it at work and having that ability to do so. We've got, uh, I think, 400 in our um, support circle now. So it just grew and it grew very fast once people knew about it. Great. You had a lot of really good points there. So a couple of things I just want to reiterate because I thought they were really important. One is that um, the safe space aspect. We don't record our circle meetings. Um, we make sure to share on the front end of those meetings our rules of engagement and kind of share that confidentiality of those circles and the purpose of the circles. Um, if somebody discloses to us their disability, you know, we never share that information without their permission. Um, you know, it's up to each individual when and how they disclose. And just because they disclose their disability to, let's say to me, doesn't mean that they are okay with that disability being disclosed to everyone. Um, so that's really important to our groups as well to maintain that, that integrity and that confidentiality. 
Um, and then the other piece is um, the structure I thought was super important. That's one benefit, I think, of how we're structured with the global board and then having the focus chapters is we're always there to assist where we can of our focus chapters, provide those additional resources, the, the budgeting and all of that is maintained at the global level. So we work very closely with our focus chapters when they're putting programming together, bringing in speakers to make sure that, that we can um, fund that and that all groups get um, the support that they need. Um, so I think great points, really good points. And with that, I'm gonna to move to Debbie and Christy to share. Let's start with Debbie. Share, what advice would you have for focus chapters? Well, I love what everyone has said, but I would say, um, don't doubt yourself because that was a big part of my hesitancy. I mean, I was so excited for the request to be a caregiver rep, but I, I was really doubting myself. And so I would say, don't doubt yourself and recognize that there are a lot more people living in similar, living in a similar journey that you are. Um, and this is a great time to do it. I mean, with all the negative, not so great things that came out of COVID, the really one of the really great things is the recognition that we can't pretend like we're not a whole person. We can't leave our home life at home and go to work anymore. Um, I mean, our home life was work for a few years. So it it kind of gave us a platform to be able to, I think that's why this ramped up so quick. The caregiver chapter did the same, started at zero, boom, we exploded. And it's because people are looking for that connection now. Um, and so this is a great time to do it. And I think the other thing I would say is in line with the um, support circles that we do monthly, yes, it's confidential, um, but learn to be okay with silence. And sometimes we'll have a topic that's a really difficult one and somebody will say something and they will just be quiet for you know a period of time and learn to be okay with that because it allows people who um, aren't always quick to speak to process and then feel comfortable in the silence to be able to speak up so i think those are the things that popped into my mind that's great and, that's and honestly silence can be supportive yes absolutely and Christy. I, yeah, I just have one, one ad. Um, and you talked about creating the framework and resources to support the chapter. I think that's so integral. And then um, I think we've talked about support circles. Uh, we also have chapter meetings. So there's kind of the sort of these two, two pieces that are happening. And um, the, the one other piece I would think about as as uh, you look at a focus chapter or think about uh, standing one up is surveying the interest of those to find topics and um, find ways to really engage. So if if you start with what we'll say a chapter, but maybe not a support circle just yet, because you're trying to build up a chapter to then um, you know have some deeper, richer conversation maybe survey the interests of those that are coming to those uh, to that chapter or thinking about that chapter to, to figure out, you know, how might we deliver, you know, what's going to be really meaningful to you? Is it how to care for yourself, how to care for a loved one, for example, uh, in, in the work that Debbie and I do, or, uh, you know, what's really, what are they really hoping to, to learn and gain from being a part of that particular chapter. And Kelly, if I can just say one more thing, Christy sparked a thought. Um, you know, I know we've all mentioned a lot of numbers, but remember that this isn't about the number. And so remember that it's about the individual. It's about each individual employee, where they're at. So yeah, yes, our numbers have grown, but honestly, I'd be okay if it was, if it was just still impacting a small number of people. It's giving, it's allowing our fellow employees to have an outlet during their day, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, connect with other people that are dealing with the same thing. So 
like I said, we've, we've mentioned the numbers, but the numbers aren't really what's important. It's the individuals. That's a really good point. And I think we try to do that a lot too, just in, in our measurements. It's, it's about the, the qualitative, not the quantitative. So um, there's nothing more um, important to me than when I hear from an employee who says, you know, that was the, the best presentation I've heard in my career at the bank and that moved me and that impacted me to do this or that, right? And, and to see the action our employees are taking to you know, visit our small business directory and, and purchase from a disability owned business or sign up for volunteering or when we bring in a nonprofit like we brought in Best Buddies in March this year to hear how employees across the United States are signing up for the, the buddy walks and looking for how they can get involved with those organizations. It's just that's to me where the real power of the group lies is in helping employees to find each other and helping employees to take action in the things that matter most to them. All right, so we probably have about, I would say one more question before we wanna kind of open it up and, and let others ask questions. And this is kind of a big one. So I'll let, take your time answering it. But the question I really wanna know is what's on the horizon? for your chapter, either the rest of this year or as you think about 2023 and beyond, where are you really hoping to go with your chapter? What kind of programming are you thinking of doing? Um, and let's go again reverse. I'm liking this forwards, backwards, reverse. So we'll start with Christy and Debbie on this one. Sounds good. We'll split it in half, Debbie. I'll start with the Caregiver Summit. And I know we've I'll let you talk about the other pieces. So uh, November is caregiver month, as we talked a little bit about before. And uh, Debbie and I and a team are hard at work, uh, really planning for that caregiver summit. Uh, it started a few years ago. This was, I think, Debbie and um, Mary. So she's, she's another member of our caregiving uh, focus chapter who started the caregiver summit. And it's really to connect with employees, um, really, bring information, resources, and really support them where they are. Um, and always looking to bring in new voices and, and new information to support um, caregivers and, and caregivers of all, in all different spaces, right? So you may be caring uh, for your aging loved one or your young loved one or, um, you know, wherever that may be. Um, and so just just really building out uh, that summit program and delivering on uh, a couple of different days, uh, different shorter topics, really consumable topics uh, for people to, to um, uh, learn and grow and, and hopefully help one another. And I would just add to that, um, the summits are like our big thing we love to do every year. Um, but we also have, we just actually implemented in the last couple of months, we're doing monthly lunch and learns. Um, we were getting some feedback that they are, our members wanted more opportunities to connect. And um, we are so, so lucky to have um, someone on our board who is who facilitates for a living, and um, she is wonderful at pulling together decks for us and topics. And so we've been doing that now for a couple months, um, and we've gotten really great feedback. So our new lunch and learns is kind of fun. Um, we also are looking more into partnership with other focus chapters and other BRGs and um, our development network and our virtual development network. Uh, just to to find those areas where we overlap, where we um, have common interests, so that we can not only help each other in marketing and reaching out to our employees in each other's chapters, but also so that we can cover more um, wide range of topics. And um, so that's something that we're really looking to ramping up and spending more time in um, finding those opportunities. Wonderful. Yes, our caregivers focus chapter is a very active chapter. And we appreciate everything that you do. 
And you. Kristen, if you could share where mental yeah, health we're... is going this year and into yeah. next year. Um, uh, Debbie made a great point actually about uh, partnering with other BRGs. I think that's that's helped make some of the events really successful. So I, I agree with her goal. That's something we want to continue. That's something we want to look into for the next year. Um, it's certainly a topic that affects every, all across all different groups. Um, continuing the support circle and how can we make it better? Keep you know trying to evolve. Um, we've do the events that have been successful already. We've done some with our employees assistance program that are usually really popular um, webinars that they do. Um, and also seeing if we can bring in some outside speakers. Um, but the one thing that's I'd say different that this year the team wants to do is they're working on, they wanna work on more educational type materials like trainings and things that can be used for, um, you know, could managers and coworkers get this information to better understand their colleagues or their employees? Um, and we're just really in the brainstorming um, phase for that. But you know, these conditions are far more common than people may realize. And the only reason we don't hear about them more is because people are afraid to talk about them. Um, and that's something that our chapter is really trying to do something about to make it um, something that we can openly discuss. Thank you. Yep, there's a complexity for sure to mental health conditions, not only the per pervasive stigmas, right, that have continued for so long and that there's a lot of that, that hurdle to overcome of people misunderstanding, but there's also the, the invisible nature to mental health conditions as well that, um, you know, there's a lot of work there for helping leaders and others understand how they can support their employees. So, yeah. You know and how their employees can maybe feel more comfortable coming forward if they are having something that's that coming forward and then asking maybe for some kind of an accommodation to help with something that they're dealing with at that time. Great, thanks Kristen. And Jane and Kelly um, from the Deaf and Hard of Hearing chapter, what do you have coming up or planned for the next year? Thanks, Kelly. I'm, I'm hearing a theme here. Partnering with other BRGs is definitely something on the horizon, but also more, um, I will say, internally, selfishly for our community and specifically is we are also investigating and I'm partnering with our HR partners on this to get specific information about medical resources for our needs. For example, whether we need surgeries for our ears or hearing aids for our ears or um, the specialist that we need to see because usually when you have a disability in your ear, you definitely need to go see an ENT specialist, which is um, not available in every community. Sometimes you have to drive to a, a centralized city to get that assistance. So mm -hmm. I've been, what we are on the horizon, and for those of you who don't know, internally we do have an annual enrollment coming up for our medical benefits. So partnering with our benefits community is something that's definitely a focus for us right now. And I've been uh, trying to glean that information and possibly working with our providers to um, that are external to U.S. Bank and getting information with them as well. So that's definitely one big area of focus for us right now, as well as I hope we continue to grow and reach out to our friends out there in the community that also share whether they are deaf and hard of hearing themselves or care for someone who's deaf and hard of hearing or just advocate like our wonderful advocate Kelly is. Um, so um, we definitely want to continue to grow our momentum and growth. Yep, I would agree with everything you said, Jane. Um, of course, trying to bring awareness to our group. Um, a lot of new members had mentioned they didn't know we existed, but they're, they're just so happy to join. Um, and again, we're happy to give them this confidential platform. Um, last meeting was really fun too, because Jane put together some trivia for us to do. So we switched it up a little bit um, and it was fun and engaging. 
Um, so we'll just continue to look for different ways um, to have our monthly meetings and uh, definitely participate in events like this. Um, you know, we, Jane and I also participated in the Global Awareness Accessibility Day event. Um, that was a lot of fun. We did myths versus truths. Um, celebrities who experienced deaf and hard of hearing. Um, we also did an American Sign Language demo. So uh, we definitely enjoy doing events and uh, just bringing awareness. Love it. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning Global Accessibility Awareness Day. I think this was the first time that U.S. Bank had a large company-wide scale event to celebrate Global Accessibility Awareness Day in May. And um, as Kelly mentioned, we had the deaf and hard of hearing panel, we had a vision disabilities panel, and we had a parents of children with disabilities panel. So um, was really great to be able to share those first person experiences with others in the bank and really help people understand how accessibility or a lack thereof impacts people with disabilities. So um, that was really great. And Jane, I have to shout out to you for the advocacy work you're doing with our benefits, because I remember, and I, I have bad memory, so I don't know if it was, I, I'm going to say, disclose, I don't know that this was U.S. Bank. It could have been my previous employer, but my daughter wears hearing aids. So I remember looking at the hearing aid benefits and seeing that it only covered through like age 14 for children, mm -hmm. and it didn't cover adults at all. And I'm like, so are they trying to say that people miraculously hear when they hit the age of 14? Like what happens, right? So I'm so glad to see um, the insurance companies are, are increasing their coverage in that space and that we have people like Jane and others within the focus chapters who are advocating to, to get those benefits even better than they are today. So thank you. All right, and let's move to Mary for the physical disabilities chapter. What is on your horizon for that group? Yeah, and I want to echo the same thing to Jane. That is one of the big things that comes up in our smaller group is the um, getting accessibility to the benefits and what can help these people that are really going through from someone that has lived with a disability their entire life to someone overnight became disabled. And I always, when I do the training, I say, Unfortunately, this is a group that anyone can join at any point in their life and probably will. And if not, they're going to be a caregiver or have someone in their family that joins this group. So to be aware and have that stuff aware to um, all employees is so, so huge, especially for our group. Um, one of the great things that we've been doing, and we just, like I mentioned, um, just wrapped it up, is we kind of honed in on July as our month for our physical disabilities group. It kind of coincides with the um, month where the ADA was signed into law. Um, that was July 20, July 26, um, 1990. And so we've kind of taken that month to share with the physical disabilities group in our chapter. And the really great thing about ours is I get people and I ask for volunteers. And these are people that have never spoken before, never had the chance to have a platform. And all of a sudden they're sharing their story and they think it's so incredible. So I'm hoping that, you know, going forward, we can continue to do that in July. This um, was our third year. Um, Last year, we did the quote unquote joys of traveling, which anyone with a physical disability knows that is an oxymoron. Um, and then we did um, the one this year in This Is Us. And it's just, you know, a day in the life of a person with a disability. So that's so great for people that, like I said, to have a platform and share their story and share the uh, things, the hurdles they've had to overcome. We also have caregivers of people with physical disabilities in our group as well. So it gives them a lot of encouragement. It gives them some resources. I love when people like you, Kelly, shoot me a message. Hey, I don't even know where to start. Where do I go? And I've got that resource to go to them. Um, and then the other thing that we've done, and, and I just shot you an email this morning, so hopefully we can partner on this again. Um, but I've partnered with our local chapter of um, the Berea Chamber of Commerce, of which I am now the president of. Um, and my daughter runs that, um, she's executive director. So we've partnered with our BRG group here to bring in speakers, um, to talk to businesses and how to make them more accessible. What brings in people with disabilities to spend more money at your, at your place? Um, you know, are aisles easy to get through? Are, is it conducive to people that have, that can't stand loud noises or uh, bright, bright lights and stuff like that? So we've really come to, um, this will be our second year that we're gonna be doing that. 
And I'm working with a lot of local um, universities here and uh, people that want to partner and do this as part of their DEI series. So kind of making that connection is kind of awesome that spawned off of this little idea that this bank had five or six years ago of starting this group. So it's really been beneficial in my life, in my community. And I thank you again for helping us to partner in that. Absolutely. And thanks, Mary. Thanks for mentioning the, the community involvement too. That's such an important piece of what we do, the programming. Um, events like this with disability in Wisconsin. I know we've done some events with disability in Minnesota. And then of course the Berea Chamber of Commerce um, that we did last year and, and we'll participate again this year. So um, that's really all the questions I have for our panel. I do see a couple of questions in the Q&A and I wanna make sure we answer those. Um, so the first question was, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually reverse the order of these questions. So one question was, is the total number of focus chapters four? Um, and the answer to that is we have more. That's just who's on the panel today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share again this one slide just to be able to show you a visual and help with what we have from a focus chapter perspective. So we started with blind and low vision, caregivers, deaf and hard of hearing, invisible disabilities, mental health, and physical disabilities. So most of the ones that you're seeing on the slide, we added cancer as a focus chapter in 2021. And actually, um, later on this month, we're going to be announcing our newest focus chapter, which is neurodiversity. So that would bring our total to eight. And we will continue to add as we have interesting groups um, where it makes sense to, to have those focuses within our disability group. Obviously, that, that we can't encompass everything for the disability community. So where we don't have a focus chapter, we cover um, the other programming through our global board and the events that we hold through those monthly meetings and the, the advocacy we do in those monthly meetings. Um, the question that's kind of a follow-up to that is, how did we start the different chapters? Did we start them all at once or did they naturally get there over time? So we actually started by adding disability reps to our board. And that's when we were a virtual chapter. And then when we went to the global chapter, we, we asked the disability reps if they would lead slash co-lead our, um, our focus chapters. And that's how this year was really the start of, of transitioning to focus chapters. So we had support circles and committees running independently before that point, and now they roll up through the focus chapters. Anything anyone else would add to the answers I just gave? Kelly, I would just add that through our group, I just had a recent person join <clears throat> who would like to start a chapter on long COVID because um, it is a real thing. People that have had COVID that are dealing with its symptoms. So that might be something to talk about within our group and how we actually start that or if it falls into the neurodiversity group or something of that matter. But uh, it was something brought to my attention. I thought I would mention it. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that, um, I know we're, we're just about five minutes to the top of the hour, so I'd like to turn it back over to Juan. Great, thank you, Kelly. And, and wow, I uh, am so impressed and so appreciative. There's a lot of thank yous, first of all. What an amazing group of leaders from US Bank who you know, are leading by example, their presence and, and commitment of time today. I couldn't be more thankful, so thank you. Uh, for a great two hours today. I uh, also want to say a special thank you to our programming committee at Disability Inn, especially Martha Kendler, who, who do a lot of work behind the scenes to make events like this uh, possible. I just want to add a few reflections in keeping with the spirit of the vision and mission of Disability Inn, which is to build an ecosystem of employers where we can share information and have opportunities like today. And there were so many takeaways. I, as an HR leader and a member of Disability Wisconsin, I was furiously scribbling, scribbling down notes. Uh, although I do want to remind everyone in the next few weeks, if you did register, we will be sending you a recording of today's session. But Astrid, with her op opening remarks, I was really impacted because at Freighted Health, we are focused on health equity. So to talk about U.S. banks, um, goal on uh, closing the wealth 
uh, the racial wealth gap was really impactful and I encourage all of you as you go back to the to the recording to, to look at their access commitment webpage. I thought that was really interesting. Emily, your comments in terms of not just why, you know, we know why this work is important, but also sharing data and the fact that employers who focus on a strong accommodation process, uh, their four-year retention rate is 13% is uh, higher than, than other organizations is really meaningful to me. And your comments about distinguishing accommodations versus accessibility, I think is really informative and educational. And I love the way that US Bank is, is backing up their, their values by, by making, uh, by having a plan to, to have required disability awareness and accessibility training and building a playbook for leaders. So that's something I took away. And then Kelly, as always, I know Kelly, so you did a great job in your, your comments about the core actions uh, that all the BRG share around connect, share, and grow, I think is really, really informative and, and something, again, I took away. And then again, this, this distinguished panel of leaders, uh, your leadership by example, uh, your commitment of time and your comments around uh, taking a passion, being brave, and, and bringing uh, not only an individual's authentic self to work, but making it possible for others to bring their authentic self to work, I think is really fantastic. So um, again, I couldn't be more impressed. I, pre I thank you all for joining today. I wanna to thank all of you as participants for taking the time today. Um, and I'll just make a final note as we continue to uh, live out our vision of disability in Wisconsin. We do have our annual Wisconsin Ability Summit coming up on October 13th. Uh, as we come out of the COVID experience, uh, we are doing it in person. So I encourage you all to learn more about that event. And if you're able to join, we certainly invite you to do so. So with that being said, uh, we are gonna wrap today's event. Thank you all again, and I wish you uh, a great rest of the week. Thank you.